You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. I, I take issue with one part of that. Okay. The fact that you said don't include Justin Fields in, in, in that group, I think you have to include Justin Fields in that group because the reason why he is viable is because he scrambles so much. If you take out his scramble, that's fair. That's fair. He's what he's like maybe one of the last year it was one of the worst passing performances we've ever seen. Like it was on par with like Josh Rosen when you take out his scrambling. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, boy, oh boy, was I glad to hear that the other day. I don't remember why I was... Oh, it was on accident. I was listening to the Ringer podcast, and it just started playing the next episode, and it was Why Mobility is the Future of NFL Quarterbacking. And I didn't even know what the heck they were talking about. They were going on and on. But these are very respected individuals. At least one of them is. Both of them are big stat guys. Uh, I think Steven Ruiz is the one that dropped the line, but Ben Solak was the one he was talking to. But again, I was the one that told you that. And I again, I thought I was by myself. Nobody's saying that. But here you go. You got statistics people who looked at it and said, if you take away Justin Fields' mobility, it was one of the worst passing performances we've ever seen and as i said that that does include trubisky so he is a worse passer than trubisky and it was down there with josh rosen 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 if you know you know but anyways all gloating aside uh the on the docket today i want to start going through our roster uh excuse me (laughs) no we just did everybody just tuned out dang it come back i want to go through our schedule our schedule as some people say for some reason. Kind of makes sense, actually. But nope, it's schedule. Because English doesn't super make sense. Watch your mouth when you're talking to me. The question, though, is how to go about doing this. I, I My temptation is to just go team by team and kind of get a, a look at who we're going up against, get an idea of these different teams. But you know what that means. we we got to talk about the Bears today. <laughs> I don't want to overstate my welcome. Because, you know. But how about we just start by going through what the schedule looks like? We we did that very briefly when the schedule came out. We'll do that again. We'll see what we got for time. Um, the Bears actually shouldn't take a lot of time because we've talked about them kind of ad nauseum. So maybe it'll be, we'll look at the overview, and then we'll do a brief overview again of the, uh, the Bears, and, and then we'll move on tomorrow to the next one, you know? So I'm going to bust out the handy-dandy Packernet 2023 Green Bay Packers schedule with regional TV blackouts. This is, I will say, my favorite schedule, not just because it's Packernet. Most schedules are terrible. I really like this one. It's very straightforward. It's easy to read. It's not, you know, you don't have to scroll every single time. Home and Away is color-coded. You can see the time. You can see when, you know, Fox or Primetime or all that good stuff, man. I just, I just like it. So anyways, uh, preseason, there's not a ton to really dig into, but we have it. Uh, Friday, August 11th, which is super crazy that we're talking about like a month from now. One month and like a week. But we will be at the Cincinnati Bengals. That's going to be at 6 p.m. Then uh, the next week is going to be at home, New England Patriots. That's at 7 p.m. And then August 26th is the Seattle Seahawks. That one is going to be at noon. Then 
we get into the regular season. So um, right off the bat, as you know, we're going to Chicago. A little bit unfortunate, but at the same time, it's, it's, it really is a good thing. Uh, as much as I hate that our first game is Chicago, it's going to be tough. I mean, it's tough for everybody, but especially for a younger team that doesn't have as much chemistry. Sure would be nice to not face a division rival, especially the Chicago Bears at this time. I, with that said, it's significantly better than if we had played the Vikings or the Lions, in which I would have not a massive amount of confidence. The Bears are a bad football team. I'm not saying we're going to win. I have no idea what's going to happen. It really depends how prepared our team is going to be and how bad the Bears still are. Remember, they, they the Bears came out last year, and even though the 49ers were a freaking joke, they came out beat the 49ers. That's where every single Bears fan has that stupid Twitter header of them sliding in water. Apparently that's the most exciting thing that's ever happened in their lives. So I, I you know, I don't know, but it's a 325 game, which means we're going to have a little bit of extra time to have panic attacks, watch, you know, Lions, Vikings, whatever happens to be on and just pace back and forth, having a heart attack about this stupid game. Then we'll have a week and it's the Atlanta Falcons. This is on the road again, which isn't great, but this is two teams that have not historically been very good. Now, again, I'll, I'll go team by team a little bit more in depth as we go along a little later. This is just as it is. But right off the bat, it feels like, at least, again, based on what these teams were last year, this is a decent start to kind of get your feet wet. Then you've got the New Orleans Saints. It's a little bit tougher. This is the new revamped Derek Carr New Orleans Saints. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I would assume it's good, but, you know, whatever. But we'll see. I mean, this is potentially scary. I mean, you got Derek Carr, you got Chris Olave, you got Michael Thomas, and then a defense that is pretty notorious. Um, we'll see how it shapes out, but that could be tough. However, that is our first home game. Then we are home again, and it's the Lions. So it does kind of suck in a way that it's we got two pre presumably easier games, but it's early and on the road. Then when we finally come home, they're tougher opponents, the Saints and the Lions. Then we're back on the road against the Las Vegas Raiders. Remember, this is the Jimmy Garoppolo Las Vegas Raiders, which I think could potentially be a disaster. I don't really know, um, but the, the 49ers could not get rid of that guy fast enough. I thought that they were doing okay with him. They seemed to not really like him, and I think he's kind of thrived in that system that makes it easy for quarterbacks. Um, and now they're there with Josh McDaniels, and I think everything that guy touches turns to crap. I don't know why. He's continually getting hired. I don't know, but maybe... Uh, Mick Lombardi, their offensive coordinator, has got something figured out. I have no idea. But Jimmy Garoppolo, Devontae Adams, it's Hunter Renfro, et cetera, et cetera. Could be, could be a really good team. Could be complete freaking disaster. Then week six, we have our bye. It's a relatively early bye. But, you know, I don't want to call it a gauntlet because that's not necessarily the case. But I think it's nice to take some time, lick your wounds, really kind of assess where we're at. You know, because remember, we did that last year. We assessed where we were. We fixed a lot of the issues, especially on defense, and we came back strong, except the season was basically over. So this will be an opportunity to kind of reassess for the coaches and say, look, this is working, this isn't working, we got to try some new stuff here. We come out of the bye October 22nd at Denver, um, another team that I know absolutely nothing about. Obviously, they were a complete disaster last year, but Denver is never really easy to figure out what they're going to be. And as much as everybody's laughing, um, I halfway expect a bounce back from Russell Wilson. I think uh, Sean Payton is going to have this thing humming a little bit more professionally than it was last year when, uh, what's his name, the Packer guy got hired over there and just turned it into a circus and it was kind of a disaster. Then we get two home games in a row. We got the Minnesota Vikings. I'm really hoping at that point the Vikings were starting to see some of the uh, some of the cracks, you know. Not as strong as they were last year, but, you know, for all I know, they're coming into this 7-1 and one, or however many games they played. But I'm hoping at this point, you know, we, we've had some time. We're in week 8. It's midseason. We're at home. Haven't had a home game since September 28th, so literally one month since we've been at home. It's a noon game. It's on Fox. Like, it just feels like a Packers game. It's going to be chilly, you know, October uh, 22nd. No, 29th. This is kind of... um. A game that in my mind is somewhat circled just from the standpoint of this is kind of a reassessment game in my mind and we'll see when we get there if that's still the case but now is when things should start coming together if if, if they haven't earlier on by now is sort of okay you're home it's been a month you've 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 had some time to lick your wound 
This is a common opponent. What is this football team? And hopefully it's a positive thing, because November 5th we get the LA Rams. The Packers have historically done a very good job against the Rams. They are in a complete nosedive. Now, we don't have Aaron Rodgers. Maybe that was just an Aaron Rodgers thing. He dominated the, the Rams. I don't really know, but um, I'm hoping for that to continue. If we can beat the Vikings and then beat the Rams, we've got a little bit of momentum. Then we go on the road to the Steelers. Again, another team that I don't know too much about, largely because of their quarterback situation. I kind of have Kenny Pickett down, as I've mentioned, as a big um, a guy that's going to take a big step. I don't see anybody really talking about him. It's all about Fields is magically going to become really good at stuff that he's terrible at. Yeah, maybe. Uh, why don't we look at the guy that actually had a pretty good year as a rookie and, and was one of the top quarterbacks in the NFL in the second half of the season? Maybe that would be something to look at, but, you know, whatever. What do I know? But again, scary team, right? They've got some scary defensive pieces. They're always a tough defensive team. They've got, uh, you know, Kenny Pickett. they got George Pickens. Allen Robinson's there now. So we'll see. Then we're back home against the Chargers. The Chargers are another kind of weird team. We, we know the Chargers pretty well, but it's one of those situations where I always think the Chargers should be better than they are. Um, you know, again, Justin Herbert, very good quarterback. You've got Keenan Allen and Mike Williams, and they added Quentin Johnston, which I think is weird. Got a lot of needs, especially on defense, and you're getting a third wide receiver, but whatever. So they always, in my mind, should be good and should be tough, but never super are, so we'll see. Then we're on the road against the Detroit Lions, and this is a Thursday game. By the way, this is, as was pointed out the other day on the, the thing, our second Thursday game. So we haven't had any... Oh, shoot, we did have a Monday. I haven't been doing a good job. So... Going back to week four is Thursday night against the, the Lions. Short week for us, short week for them. Then we get next week Monday, so we get a little bit of a reprieve against the Raiders. Then we get our bye week. Then it's just Sunday at 3, Sunday at noon, Sunday at noon, Sunday at noon, Sunday at noon. Then we get Thursday, November 23rd, at Detroit, 11.30 a.m. So, th I mean, th this is kind of a tough stretch here because you got the Steelers, I think, are tough. The Chargers are going to be tough. The Lions on Thursday at home and their home are going to be tough. Then we then we get to go back home, but it's the Kansas City Chiefs. That's going to be a Sunday night game at 7:20. Obviously, that's going to be really tough. Um, if the Packers end up being competitive or winning that game, then there's really I mean there's there's no ceiling to this thing. So so th this is kind of the ramp up, right? Again, we've had the the beginning portion where I think we're going to take some lumps, reassess during the bye, and then again sort of that second week after the bye when you come home. That's sort of, okay, where are we at? And hopefully it's in a good spot because, again, Steelers, Chargers, Lions on Thursday, Chiefs on primetime, that's rough. And we got to come out of that with some wins. Then after that Sunday night, December 3rd against the Chiefs, we get another Monday game. So plenty of, uh, plenty of primetimes again. Monday night at the New York Giants. Another relatively known commodity that generally is not the best team in the world. Daniel Jones is kind of so-so. I know they beat up on us last year, but I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, Saquon is, you never know. He's definitely not as good as he should have been all these years, but he's a talented dude. The wide receiver situation is kind of bad. They did get Jalen Hyatt. We'll see where he's at at this time in the year, but Paris Campbell, Darius Slayton, and Isaiah Hodgins are kind of where they're at with that situation. But uh, they did also bring in Darren Waller, the tight end, which is a pretty big get. Then December 17th, we're back home, regular old noon game, and this is kind of down the stretch here. So we're, we're home, we're through the rough patch, final push, hopefully pushing to try to get into the playoffs if that hasn't been resolved by now, hopefully in a positive way. Probably won't be with four weeks left. And so this is kind of that, that final stretch. You got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, that's with uh, Baker Mayfield at quarterback. So weird, all the, all the quarterback changeover and everything else. But we'll see how that pans out. The Tampa Bay has been kind of, I don't want to say downward spiral quite like the Rams, but it's similar. Trying to kind of hold on for dear life with, again, Baker and, and whatever else they can grab. Then we got two games on the road. We got another Sunday noon game against the Carolina Panthers. So that'll be somewhat interesting with the Bryce Young Carolina Panthers. They also drafted Jonathan Mingo, which makes me very sad because I was a big Jonathan Mingo fan. If he ends up being a great wide receiver, I will be sad. Then December 31st at Minnesota at 7.20, so another late night game, Sunday night primetime game. Again, it's just, if we're in it, then then this is kind of a prove it game. And I know Minnesota's supposed to take a step back, but I don't think they're going to end up being, you know, a bottom five team. You know they got the firepower on offense. So, I mean, if, if you're a legit 
football team, this is this is one you got to win. Minnesota on the road. Then January sixth is the uh, final game. It's a uh, Saturday game. Saturday, Saturday, January sixth at eleven p.m. That can't be right. Yeah, that's that's got to be fixed. But everywhere I'm finding it's it's TBD. Sunday, January seventh, not Saturday. January Sunday, January seventh. Time is TBD. Anyways, um, again, th- this is one I absolutely expect the Packers to be able to win because I don't think the Bears are going to be anything more than a low-end mediocre team. If we go into this game thinking this is going to suck, we're about to get beat, then, you know, it's time for draft talk, baby. Anyways, before we move on to the individual team, why don't we kind of take a closer look at the Packers schedule and how it stacks up to everybody else. So these are obviously all projections. We have no idea. Um, but based on last year's win totals, I think is probably how they're doing this, is how most people do strength of schedule. Um, the Packers have the 14th easiest schedule, so it's right in the middle. And um, as compared to the rest of the NFC North, the Bears have the 6th easiest. The Lions have the 11th easiest. Minnesota is at the 25th easiest, so they've got the harder schedule. Now, again, as I said, I think I said on this podcast, I said at some point in my life, um, the Chicago Bears were supposed to have the fourth easiest schedule last year, and they ended up with, I think, the fourth or fifth hardest. And, and even that, looking back, saying fourth or fifth hardest is not necessarily true. Um, for example, one of the teams that they played was San Francisco. San Francisco had a pretty successful season, and so they look at that as a difficult matchup, except it wasn't. The Bears played them when they had Trey Lance at quarterback, and Lance was a disaster, and they played in that monsoon game, which for some reason Bears fans think is to their disadvantage. I don't know why. But the bottom line is the San Francisco 49ers played like garbage with a quarterback that didn't even make it through the season. So um, somewhat incorrectly reflects how difficult their schedule was. But anyways, it's, it's, a rough, it's a rough look both going forward and backwards. The five easiest schedules, Saints, Falcons, Colts, Panthers, 49ers. Why in the world the uh, 49ers are on here? I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, good for them. The five hardest schedules, Patriots, Raiders, Dolphins, Bills, and Chiefs. But that's when you can kind of compare the 2022 to the 2023 and see where there's some discrepancies. The biggest reason being, as I said with the Chicago Bears, when we assume that Everything this year is going to be the same as everything last year in terms of the quality of the team. One of the things is looking at how much easier or harder the schedule is because as I've constantly said on the podcast, you don't play football in a vacuum, right? If you're the third best team, that doesn't mean anything without 31 other teams. And so the team with the biggest improvement is the Pittsburgh Steelers. Steelers had the 31st easiest, so the second hardest schedule last year. They have the eighth easiest schedule this year. So you can look at things like that and start, you know, putting in some bets about who's going to end up having a better season than projected or whatever. The Bears are the second. They go from 28th to 6th. The Lions are 10th. They go from 17th to 11th, so they also uh, got a little easier. Again, projected. Minnesota got significantly harder, which is going to continue to work against them as they, you know, it's not it's not like they had an easy schedule last year. It was kind of middle of the pack. But you add in the fact that they're likely going to regress in the category of one score wins and kind of see a little bit more of what they are and on top of that they have one of the hardest schedules projected in the nfl this year green bay is just right in the middle of everything they were 15th last year they're 14th this year they rank 15th in terms of improvement just just steady eddie across the board then finally you look at rest and if you remember the green bay packers got completely screwed with this last year their rest schedule was absolutely horrible this year right in the middle and and really it's just a question of when you play a game how much more or less rest do you have than your opponent chicago is tied for number one the nfl is doing everything in their power to make chicago do something <laughs> there they, they could not have had i mean one of the easiest schedules the absolute most rest. In fact, they're tied for the most at 12 days of rest more than their um, opponents, but they are the only team that is not negative any week. So they not one time this year do they have a negative rest differential with their opponent. They just have positive rest in, uh, looks like, three different games. Three days of rest, 
three days of rest and six days of rest above their opponent. Then as you scroll down, you got Detroit and Green Bay right next to each other. Detroit is only plus one. Green Bay is at exactly zero, so they're dead even average, so you can't complain about that. Minnesota, again, getting kicked. They're at negative two. Not the worst, but um, they do have a negative rest differential. So that also is going to kind of weigh them down a little bit. It looks like they have a three-day rest advantage one week, a one-day rest advantage another week, and then they have uh, one day disadvantage, another one day disadvantage, another one day disadvantage, and a three day disadvantage. So that all adds up to uh, negative two. The hardest is San Francisco, which is great to see considering they're somehow getting one of the easiest schedules. But um, negative 20 days of rest. The only team that doesn't have any positive days is it looks like the it's a very small picture Atlanta Falcons. Oh, that's not right. That's mean. If you kind of break this down a little bit more, there's a, a separate chart here. This all comes from Sharp Football. Got a couple different categories broken down here. Um, opponent days to prepare, games in each category. How many games are the Packers going to have over seven days to prepare for a game? Four. So that's somewhat average. How many are they going to have under seven? Four. So they rank 11th in this metric. So again, pretty much right in the middle and, and perfectly even again. So... Again, that's just how many days are you going to have more than seven days to prepare for your next game, and then how many days are you going to have less than seven? It's four and four. So they're one of just a couple teams that has an exactly zero differential. The Bears, of course, rank fourth in this metric. They only have one game, and this is opponent days to prepare. So uh, their opponents have one game um, of more than seven days and two less than. So the Vikings rank 25th, five days compared to two days. The heck are the Lions? Lions also rank 11th, so they're with us. Games with more or less rest days than opponents. So again, the, the first one was cumu cumulative days. This is just looking at more or less, period. So again, the Bears are the only team that uh, their opponents have more rest days, uh, zero more rest days. So they rank second. The Packers actually are pretty high in this as well. We rank fifth, even though it comes out even overall in terms of the number of days. We actually have five games that we're going to play where we have more rest as opposed to three games where our opponent has more rest. Lions rank fifth, right in line with us, and the Vikings are 24th. Two games with more rest compared to four. How many short week road games do you have is another metric. So this is basically just between zero and three. The Bears have one, so they rank 10th, which would mean there's nine with zero. Packers also just have one. Lions have two, so that sucks for them. The Vikings also have two. The teams with three are, it looks like, the Giants, the Bengals, and that's it. And it says games off-road Sunday night or Monday night football. I'm guessing that's on the road. I don't know. The Bears have one. Lions have two. Packers also have two. The Minnesota Vikings have one. And then there's just a question of a negated bye week, which I would assume, and I will look it up in a second, that just means your bye week coincides with your opponent's bye week, so you don't actually get an extra special bye week. And the Packers are one of the teams that has that. It doesn't say, but yeah, that's what it is. Here is overall what he had to say about the Packers' schedule. The Packers sit at a perfectly balanced zero in net rest, but they do have an extremely kind start to the season with some nice rest edges. Through Week 8, the Packers play four games in which they have more rest than their opponents and zero games when they are at a rest deficit. That's the best start for any team. Week 3, they take on the Saints in Green Bay, and the Saints are coming off a Monday night road game. Week 5, they get the Raiders, and thanks to the fact that the Packers played on Thursday the week prior, they get a three-day more rest. Week 6, they are on a bye, so they have more rest than the Broncos in Week 7. Week 8, they host the Vikings, who are off a Monday night game the week prior. So Packers are pretty steady, and although it's nice that they got a good start, it just kind of means that it's going to be kind of a rough stretch. So they've got the first half of the season to kind of get their feet wet and learn how to play football and learn to play together as a team. And then the training wheels come off. So, Anyways, why don't we take a break and then we'll dive into our first opponent, the Chicago Bears. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. 
it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. All right, so last year was sort of the first year of this new Chicago Bears regime, right? Ryan Poles took over. Matt Eberflus is the new head coach. A lot of excitement. This defense is going to be something else. He's never had a bad defense. They've got their hits principle. Don't know what it stands for, but it means something. Luke Getze from the Green Bay Packers goes over to be their offensive coordinator. Alan Williams, their defensive coordinator, right? Bears fans will happily tell you that it was a rebuild year. There were no expectations. Everybody knew that we'd have the number one overall pick, and it was on purpose. They tanked for on purpose. They tried and all. Bullcrap. The negative impact on a locker room for tanking an entire season is borderline irreversible damage. Nobody does that on purpose. But they ended the season 3-13. and 13. Two of those three wins came in the first three weeks. That is to say, from week four on, they won one game. And they didn't win one game the second half of the season. So they beat San Francisco 19-10 to 10 only because they started, decided to start Trey Lance. Which I said... If you've been listening, prior to that game, I really, really don't want them to start Trey Lance. If they play Trey Lance, the Bears are going to win because one of the only quarterbacks that I think is probably worse than Justin Fields is Trey Lance. Sure enough, Trey Lance was an absolute joke. And the Bears eked out a win against the San Francisco 49ers. And of course, they're bragging about that. They're a playoff team. No, dude, you didn't beat a playoff team. And who was right? I was right. You know how I know I was right? Because they won three games and had the number one overall pick. Then they go on the road to face the Green Bay Packers. Oh boy, big, tough Chicago Bears are talking all kinds of crap about here we come, it's a new era, blah, 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 27-10, Packers spank the Bears, Bears suck. Then they go and play the Houston Texans, the team that basically had the number one overall pick the entire season. And nobody thought it would be anybody other than the Houston Texans, aside from the Chicago Bears being just the worst version of anything ever. And the Bears eked out a win by three points. So, congrats on that. Then they lost to the Giants, then they got beat by the Vikings, and then they lost to the Commanders, and then they beat the Patriots. 33-14. to I don't know what that was, but I guess you could call it their only good performance of the entire year. Now, I know as a Packer fan I can't talk, but it is worth noting that Bailey Zappi was the quarterback. Justin Fields was 13 of 21 for 179 yards and a touchdown and a pick. So... Wasn't really anything Justin did, uh, at least with his arm, but obviously... Well, let me put it this way. They passed for 147 yards. They ran for 243 yards. Here's the thing, though. They didn't win a single game after that. They have not won a game since October 24th of 2022. They lost to the Cowboys horrifically. They lost to Miami. They lost to Detroit. They lost to the Falcons. They lost to the Jets. They lost to the Packers again. Then they had a bye week. Then they lost to the Eagles, they lost to the Bills, they lost to the Lions, and they lost to the Vikings. Now, there were some one-score games in here. And again, this is why I expect some return to normalcy, because you're not going to lose all these one-score games. I mean, they won one against the Texans, but they lost um, Commanders 7-12, to uh, they lost to the Dolphins by 3, they lost to Detroit by 1, 
They lost to the Falcons by three. That was just a stretch right in here. Um, they lost to Philly by five. And it looks like that's it. By the way, another interesting note, seven games. That's how many times they passed for more yards than they rushed. Seven. That's got to be some kind of a crazy record, man. Doesn't it? They were the number one rushing team in terms of total yards. The number 31 passing team. Who the heck passed for less yards than the Bears? So it was a pretty rough year. So then the next question would be, well, what did they do to improve their team? Well, they had $100 million, right? Now, before we get in this, into this, because again, Bears fans will fight you tooth and nail on this and say they had a great offseason. And in fact, many in the, in the national media will tell you they, they really did a lot to improve their team. I've done this already, but I'm going to go ahead and provide a couple receipts. Because Bears fans have short-term memory. Just like when they all pretend that they thought that this was going to be a terrible season last year, except when you go back and look at what they were saying prior to the season, how good they were going to be, and what they were saying going into that Packer game, how good they were after just beating the, the, a, a playoff team, changed their tune pretty quick. Why don't we look at who Chicago Bears fans said, and national media people said, the Bears should, would, will target. This is who they were all geeked out about. These are the guys that were going to transform this team and make them a powerhouse. Now, not all these guys are available, but it doesn't matter. The point is, this is the free agency they thought they were going to have. Ready? Saquon Barkley, Jamal Williams, Juju Smith-Schuster, Jacoby Myers, Nelson Aguilar, Mike Gesicki, uh, Dalton Schultz, Elton Jenkins, Orlando Brown, Jack Conklin, Mike McGlinchey, Jason Kelsey, Rodney Hudson, center, Deron Payne, real big on Deron Payne, uh, Javon Hargrave, Ashawn Robinson, Dalvin Tomlinson, Puna Ford, Draymond Jones, Marcus Davenport, went to the Vikings, Yannick Ngakwe, Levante David, Tremaine Edmonds, they got him, Patrick Peterson, and Jamel Dean. Here's one from Sports Illustrated, Deron Payne. Top-tier defensive tackle. How about another one? Javon Hargrave. Pro Bowl guard Elton Jenkins. And and I don't want to just gloss over that one because it's like, well, he, you know, he wasn't an uh, option. You have no idea how positive they were Elton Jenkins was going to be a Bear. Do you have any idea how many Bears fans were mocking and laughing when I told them there's zero chance the Packers are going to let him go? Where's the money going to come from? Where's the money going to come from? Packers have no money. We got $100 million. What do you got? Where's your money? You got no money. You can't pay him. You can't afford him. Guess what? Elton Jenkins is playing for the Green Bay Packers, not the Chicago Bears, like they all thought for sure. They also were positive Deron Payne was coming. Again, Yannick Ngakwe, Marcus Davenport, he went to the Minnesota Vikings. They desperately need pass rush help. They didn't get any of these defensive tackles. Deron Payne, Javon Hargrave, uh, they got a, a significantly worse version of Elton Jenkins. Yannick is not that great, but they didn't even get him. Marcus Davenport is a pass rusher that would have been fantastic. I've already praised the Vikings for getting him. I don't know how they ended up with him. Maybe I'm too high on him. I don't know. Mike McGlinchey, they thought they had him, and then he backed out and decided to go to Denver. And Bears fans are, oh, that's that's a great move by uh, by Poles. He's, he's not going to overpay. Bro, that's what free agency is. If you're looking for thrifty deals in free agency, you're going to end up with, well, exactly what you got. Nothing. You're over there shopping for day-old bread in the supermarket, trying to get a deal. Stale donuts. Vikings Dalvin Tomlinson didn't get him. Nelson Aguilar, Ethan Posick, Quan Alexander, nothing. Did get the linebackers, but, you know. Again with Orlando Brown, the offensive tackle. Premier tackle, he didn't go there. Again, Deron Payne. You know, these, these names keep coming. Again, every article you're going to find, Deron Payne is at the top of it, and Elton Jenkins is probably on it, too. Pro Football Network, Chicago Bears offseason preview, money, money, money. Beyond having the most cap space, more than uh, more on that in a moment, the Bears also have a ton of draft capital, starting with their top five pick. According to Track, the Bears, as of early January, had $119.3 million in cap space. And that includes $20 million in dead cap. All right, so let's look at what they got. Now, DJ Moore was acquired in a trade. I, I, you can't fully dismiss that, I guess. They still acquired him, and they're still paying for him, so it does count against the money. But in terms of guys they went out and got in free agency, Tremaine Edmonds, been terrible for four, uh, four years, had one good year, and they paid him a billion dollars. TJ Edwards, been a pretty solid linebacker for the Eagles. Nate Davis, mediocre guard. And again, if you look at true pass sets like Bears fans insist that you do, he is horrific. 
Demarcus Walker. Been a pretty mid-defensive tackle for pretty much his entire career. Played for Denver. Denver let him go. Houston picked him up for one year. Houston let him go. Uh, ten- Tennessee picked him up. Tennessee let him go. I mean, that, that kind of tells you something when they just never seem to come back. Um, last year was definitely his best year with Tennessee. Statistically, as a pass rusher, he was productive, especially with his eight sacks. Grades, 67 pass rush, 68 run defense. He's not necessarily the elite prospect that they were hoping for, like, for example, Javon Hargrave. Uh, they got backup quarterback P.J. Walker, Andrew Billings, defensive lineman, Travis Homer, the running back, Robert Tunyon, the tight end, Deontay Foreman, another running back, Dylan Cole, another linebacker, and uh, Rasheem Green, who I guess is their only real expenditure off the edge, and the dude is kind of awful. So they didn't exactly go out and um, kill it. The only real big addition that you can... I mean, listen, the linebackers, you have to assume, are going to impact the defense because they felt that these are the kinds of people that they need to make the defense work. That doesn't change the fact that you over-allocated resources to a position that is a low-value position. That's a losing proposition. You can call it necessary if you want, but paying Tremaine Edmonds as much as you paid him that's a bad thing. I don't care what kind of scheme you run. You need corners. You need pass rushers. You need defensive tackles. You don't have those, and you spent all your money on a linebacker. Anyways, from there, they drafted Darnell Wright, the offensive tackle, after trading away the number one spot to Carolina. And then they, they actually traded back from one to nine. They got DJ Moore, um, first and second round picks this year, 2024 first round pick, 2025 second round pick. Which again, I mean, everybody is all freaked out about the the haul. I really didn't think it was all that fantastic. I thought it was a good trade. Everybody, oh, the Bears fleeced him. No, I mean, when I did the math on it, it was exactly even. But it still was lower than what was expected. Bears fans have been saying for weeks that that's the haul they were going to get moving back to like four. They moved back to nine and got the same thing we've been hearing that they were going to get this whole time. So, I mean, it's it's a haul and it's a great thing. It's a great resource to be able to do stuff. They took the number nine pick. They traded back again and got a, um, a fourth round pick. That's who they drafted Tyler Scott with. And then finally, they stay in pick at 10, get Darnell Wright, the tackle. We'll see. I like Darnell Wright. Bears and Vikings and those, they, they always, the Bears especially, but our rivals always seem to pick the guys I like. Sam Laporta goes to Detroit, et cetera, et cetera. It happens all the time. The good news for you guys is that I apparently suck at scouting college prospects, or at least the guys that I have draft crushes on, because they never seem to pan out. Then their next pick, uh, pick 32, which could have really helped them a lot, they don't have because they went out and got Chase Claypool. Now, we all tend to overlook that, but how serious of a thing... Think about that. You got the number one overall pick. You also have pick 32. You have pick one and pick 32. That's essentially two first-round picks. They came away with just Darnell Wright. Now, again, they added picks later. We'll see what that materializes into, but as far as impact right now, that's garbage. They just got Darnell Wright. And who knows, maybe Chase has some kind of a big resurgence. The Pittsburgh Steelers obviously didn't really think so. They were happy to trade him away. The pick, by the way, went Joey Porter. Certainly would have been beneficial for the Chicago Bears. Even if they didn't want that, some of the other picks, Sam Laporta and Michael Mayer, the tight ends, Steve Avila, the guard, would have been beneficial. Derek Hall, the pass rusher, Jonathan Mingo, wide receiver. I mean, there's a lot of talent here, and they didn't get to pick again until 53, right? So pass rusher, guard, wide receiver, pass rusher, linebacker, tight end, uh, center, corner, safety, pass rusher, safety, guard, uh, defensive tackle, wide receiver, uh, cornerback, running back, and then finally the Chicago Bears get their defensive tackle. It's a lot of good positions there that they missed out on. Now, as usual, Bears fans are super excited about Javon Dexter. I don't know. I I, I see him as a run-defending defensive tackle. 6'6", 310, not very fast, never had any good pass rushing stats. But, of course, they misused him in college, and the Bears are going to unleash him, and he's going to be elite. So there you go. Now you know. Anyways, ripping through the rest of these, Tyreek Stevenson they got also in the second round, cornerback. Then in the third round, they picked another defensive tackle, Zach Pickens. In the fourth round, they got Rashawn Johnson, who they think is going to be the second coming of Walter Payton for some reason. I have no idea why. Again, the national media is very happy to get these guys hyped up, and they're very happy to listen to everything that they have to say. And so when people say that's a great value, that's a great steal, that's fine. He's still a fourth round pick. Maybe he should have been a third round pick. I don't know. I like Rashawn Johnson too. 
not elite, just a fun guy to watch. He's a powerful dude or whatever, but he's coming in at running back three, as far as I can tell, if you count the quarterback as RB1. Then they got Tyler Scott, wide receiver, followed that up with another linebacker, Noah Sewell, out of Oregon, Terrell Smith, cornerback, Minnesota, Travis Bell, defensive tackle, and Kendall Williams, son, cornerback. So what overall did they add? They got a wide receiver, two linebackers, a guard, a tackle, probably a defensive tackle, and I'm not sure if Tyreek Stevenson starts or not, maybe, and that's probably about it. I mean, they added more than that, but as far as how many guys are going to come in and make a, a significant impact, and so overall looking at their team, um, again, Justin Fields, one of the more electrifying runners that the NFL has ever seen, that does carry some value, it's not completely useless, but of course he has to learn to throw, and as I've said now several times, I mean, the, calling him a bad passer. And, and, and the reason I emphasize it is because the general perception about Fields is that he struggled as a passer, just like a lot of young quarterbacks struggle as a passer. The, the difference here, though, is your level of confidence in his ability to improve as a passer is going to have a lot to do with how bad of a passer he was, right? Being decent, but not super great. Right? This is why, oh, oh look at uh, Josh Allen. Look at Jalen Hurts. Look at Tua. Look at any of these guys that struggled coming out. None of them ever struggled to the degree that Fields struggled last year. Ever. Doesn't mean he can't get better. I'm just pointing out there is a difference here. Um, wide receiver, again, I mean, they're, they're, <laughs> Bears, Bears fans are pretty excited about a lot of their guys, but obviously a lot of them are not going to be playing very much. But DJ Moore is, is clearly going to be the wide receiver one. After that, I would assume it's Claypool and Mooney. And that's basically going to be your core of guys. And part of the issue with that is you're pretty much, re I mean, there's some rotation here, but what happens to Valus Jones? You just drafted the guy. Are we giving up on him already? Outside of the top three guys, there's not a lot of stuff going on with wide receivers. What happened to Dante Pettis that you went out and got? What happens to Tyler Scott, who you traded back to acquire another pick? You got Tyler Scott. What's his role? What about Equinemius? Part of the thing that I don't like is if you swing and 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 swing, and we don't count the strikes, we just count the hits, it's like, oh man, look at Poles got DJ Moore, son. That's solid. Yeah, dude. He threw so much crap at the wall. And even going back before that, the Bears have been constantly going out and getting free agents and everything else, trying to just jam pack. I mean, look at how many guys they got last year, and all of them were a disaster. And if we really just look at the grades, we're not looking at elite wide receivers. DJ Moore had a 73.9 grade, Chase Claypool had a 61, and Darnell Mooney had a 69. That's it. It's, it's a fine, good enough group. It is so far from an elite group of wide receivers, it's, it's silly that some people think that it is. And I'm not even positive that that's who's going to be playing. Chase Claypool was so bad, I, I don't know that he's going to be that dude. I don't know if Dar Darnell Mooney, if he takes another step back, isn't going to be supplanted by Equinemius and or Valus or whoever. The only guy that I'm extremely confident in is DJ Moore, and even that is, there's no 100% guarantee. I was 100% confident in Allen Robinson being a good wide receiver because he was one of the top wide receivers in football before he just completely fell off a cliff. Darnell Mooney I was confident in until he fell off last year. I have no idea. Uh, running backs, again, Khalil Herbert is probably going to be the guy for them. He had a pretty good year last year, but of course, Bears fans are super excited about Rashawn Johnson. I don't think it really matters. I think the Bears are going to continue to be a pretty solid rushing team. I don't think it matters all that much who's standing back there and taking the handoffs. Tight end, Cole Komet is still that dude, um, and I don't mean that dude in a positive way. I just mean he's the, the clear number one guy there. But um, he ended up with a 67 grade, so, you know, whatever. They added Tunyon. I, I don't understand the hype of Tunyon. Like, oh, they finally got this true receiving threat, da-da-da-da-da. You know, I also don't understand. Pa Packer fans are not allowed to get excited about any of their guys because everybody was made by Aaron Rodgers, right? So we can't talk about Christian Watson because, obviously, the only reason he was good is because of Aaron Rodgers, and he's gone now. Okay, Robert Tunyon was bad with Aaron Rodgers. So what the heck are we talking about here? C can we follow that same logic? Because if we do, that dude's about to plummet. Now, I don't buy into that narrative whatsoever. I don't see any correlation anywhere. I'm sure, sure you can probably find something, but I, in, in the little bit of looking I've done, I don't see any correlation between how good a quarterback is and how good a wide receiver is. And again, you can look at Devontae when he went over to play for the Las Vegas Raiders. He didn't take a half a step back. Look at Tyreek Hill leaving uh, Pat Mahomes. He had a better season. 
Again, AJ Green playing for Andy Dalton. He didn't, didn't freaking matter. Megatron wasn't terrible because he was a Detroit Lion. He's freaking Megatron. Good wide receivers are good wide receivers. DeAndre Hopkins was elite with the Texans. I mean, he had a pretty good quarterback, I guess, but not always. Constantly pushing this narrative that it, it all depends on the quarterback. No, it does not. So anyways, I think Tunyon's going to stay Tunyon, and then they have Cole Komet, and that's whatever. The offensive line uh, at left tackle, they have second round pros. And by the way, again, they, they can piss and moan about how bad the offensive line was, was and all that. Braxton Jones was a fifth round pick, had a 75 overall grade, ranked as the 19th best tackle, 70 pass blocking grade, and an 80 run blocking grade. I don't know if he's going to be able to maintain that. I don't know how that even happens. But what Bears fans should be doing, if they actually want to be taken seriously and praising Ryan Poles, they should be praising this offensive line. But they can't because then that's looking bad for Justin Fields. So they just ignore one of the biggest wins for this entire franchise, and that is finding Braxton Jones in the fifth round. But maybe he sucks. I don't know. Tevin Jenkins is a road grading run blocker and a subpar pass blocker. He is their left guard. He's been moved around. They tried him at tackle. Disaster. He pretty much wasn't even a second team guy for a while. Then they put him into guard and he found his home there. Cody Whitehair, um, elite rookie season and just hasn't really been able to do that ever since. They're moving him back to center. Nate Davis, again, mediocre, decent, whatever. But again, look at true pass sets. He's bad. I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to say about their offensive line, to be completely honest with you. I'm looking at a pretty solid offensive line, but it's the same offensive line as last year. So if, the, if, the la- if last year the offensive line was terrible, then it's still terrible. They just added a rookie. I'll let you come to your own conclusions on that. If it was a good offensive line last year, it remains a good offensive line. If it was bad last year, it remains bad. Um, On the defensive side, defensive line, again, they added Demarcus Walker and Andrew Billings. Walker is going to be more of a pass rusher. Billings, I think, is going to be more of a run defender. They really don't have anything aside from that. I mean, they have bodies, but, you know, I mean, guys like Justin Jones, who Bears fans love because he, you know, was mean to Packer fans. He he ranked 111th out of 127. He serves no purpose. And then off the edge, I mean, it's it's bad. Um, the grades for the guys that actually played last year, 48, 45, 46, and 62. 62 is the Rasheem Green that they brought in, the guy who didn't even reach 10% pressure rate and has had, I think, no more than four sacks in a season. So, I mean, it's rough up front. It's really bad. The only guy across the entire front that's inside and outside that has a 70 or higher run defense grade is Andrew Billings who had a 72. Um, As far as pass rush grades, zero are in the 70s. Uh, You've got 67 from Walker and a 66 from Billings. Then you go to linebacker. This is the the darlings of the entire defense. I thought Jack Sanborn did okay. I mean, they were all hyped up about Jack Sanborn. We got something here. This guy is going to be the greatest, this, that, or the other, and then that kind of just faded as time went on, and he didn't even play all that much. I'm guessing he was injured. I don't know, but his grades certainly leveled off. Then they got Tremaine Edmonds. Again, he had a fantastic year last year. First year, he hasn't sucked. TJ Edwards has always graded out fairly well, but I think Edmonds is supposed to be the guy, the centerpiece of the defense. I don't know, whatever. I I will grant them that they have great linebackers because it's kind of irrelevant to me. First of all, the Bears have always had great linebackers, right? I mean, since like forever. They've always had good line, and they just, when was the last time we lost to the Bears? So I, don't, I really don't care. Safety's Eddie Jackson. I mean, he's had two good years in his entire career. Last year was one of them. Not a lot of reason to get super hyped up about that. Jaquan Brisker got off to a fantastic start, but ended with just a 67 grade. He could take a step. He could be a great safety. I have no idea, but that's it. Oh, wait, corner. Sorry, I forgot corner. Um, Jalen Johnson had a 62 grade. Kyler Gordon had a 49 grade. And Kendall Vildor and Jalen Jones were 59 and 48. I don't know exactly who starts where, does what. I think the expectation is that Johnson and maybe even Tyreek Stevenson will be on the boundary. I'm not sure with uh, Kyler Gordon in the slot. It's, I mean, it's brutal. I mean, their their best corner right now seems to be Jalen Johnson, who's going into year four and again graded out as mediocre last year. I mean, his coverage grade was a 65. So, and Kyler Gordon is just terrible. So linebackers and safeties, they've got something. Defensive front and corners, it's brutal. So really, it just kind of comes down to, okay, so Packers and Bears, where is the area that we're going to struggle against them? Well, for the first thing we got to look at is, are they a good pass blocking unit or not? Because if not, we're going to run right through them. But either way, it doesn't really matter. Because again, it's largely the same offensive line as last year. They did make some changes and, and everybody's all hyped up. Well, there was a lot of movement and yeah, there's always movement for every offensive line. 
But whether the blocking was the offensive line's fault or Justin Fields' fault, it's largely the same situation. And in this situation, Justin Fields takes a lot of sacks. So there should be a, a good potential to get some pressure. The biggest fear that I have is run defense. Not allowing Justin Fields to run all over you, but while our linebackers are focused on you know, not getting outflanked by field, they're also not really being aggressive coming up, you know, coming downhill against running backs, which they never do anyways. But that would be the one thing that, that would make me nervous about the Bears is getting off the field and stopping their, their rushing attack. Because if they're getting four yards a clip, I mean, they're, they're just going to grind our defense into the dirt. So that's the biggest thing for this matchup. You have to win up front. You have to force Justin Fields to throw the ball. And by throw the ball, I don't mean force him into a passing situation, and then he says, screw this, and takes off and runs and gets an 80-yard touchdown. We should have more than capable enough cornerbacks to handle the situation. But at the end of the day, we're probably not playing man coverage because it's Justin Fields, so we're going to be playing zone. So it's really just a matter of understanding your assignments, where you're supposed to be, and making sure we get some pressure. But it all starts with winning up front, because if, if we're not going to do that and they're going to be able to run the ball, then, then our defense is just going to get tired out, worn down, and, and it's, it's an ugly situation. On the flip side, our offensive line should have very little problem protecting Jordan Love against this pass rush. We also shouldn't have that big of a problem running the ball. Despite the additions at linebacker, even with Edmonds being the fifth highest graded linebacker last year, that was entirely because of coverage. He's still graded out poor as a run defender and always kind of has. Our wide receivers should be able to beat these corners. Our offensive line should be able to beat their defensive line. We should be able to run the ball. This really just comes down to execution, right? They don't have the talent to stop anybody, but... You know, again, it starts in the trenches. Our offensive line needs to just dominate these guys so that we can run the ball at will and Love has all the time in the world in the pocket. And then it really just comes down to Love and these receivers being on the on the same page and Matt LaFleur calling good plays, right? Run the right routes, make the right throws. We got it. Again, there's just not the personnel to really do anything here. Defense is bad, even with linebackers. Linebackers can't do everything. Uh, final thing to look at here, digging into a little bit of fantasy data just for... Uh, a little bit of insights. If you're looking at what it is that beat the Chicago Bears, hilariously enough, it wasn't tight ends. In fact, they were the fourth best defense against tight ends. And then they invested all this money in linebackers. So when you're looking at matchups, the things that beat the Bears, running backs and quarterbacks. Win up front, please. That's what's going to need to happen. Offensively and defensively, win up front. It's going to be true in most games, very true in this game. Anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. You guys have yourselves a good rest of your day. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.